been a, uh, a serial speaker at the HPC and GPU supercomputing meetup. And uh, right now he is uh, working with uh, Baidu Research, but he has spent many years at the Media Research Lab and was one of the pioneers in developing many of the uh, machine learning algorithms uh, in both uh, the uh, deep neural network algorithms as well as uh, some early working uh, uh, support vector machine, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, way back in, uh, at uh, UC Berkeley at the very beginning of using CUDA for uh, machine learning algorithms. And uh, his uh, uh, package, Copperhead, has been downloaded uh, hundreds of times, not thousands of times now. And, um, uh, many of uh, his uh, work has been open sourced. Uh, now he uh, is uh, working with uh, Professor Andrew Ng uh, at uh, Baidu Research Lab, building up that lab and uh, just shared some very interesting culture building exercise and uh, with a fast growing environment. So today we're very fortunate to have him here um, to help share some information about uh, his experience with deep learning as well as some of the current research. Great, thanks Jika. Um, so uh, feel free to stop me at any time we can be interactive. I'd rather be interactive than lecture the whole time, uh, even though I do like hearing myself speak. <laughs> so, but yeah, feel free to, to interrupt. Um, so before I get started about deep learning, I wanted to put in a little explanation about Baidu. How many of you have heard of Baidu before? Okay, actually quite a few of you, which, which makes me uh, happy. Um, I think Baidu is somewhat less well known in the West than it should be. Uh, Baidu is a, a big company. They basically power the Chinese internet. They um, do the most of the searches in the Chinese internet, um, sort of similarly to Google. Um, so they're, they're a big and, and I think uh, increasingly important company <coughs> in technology in general. And um, they're investing heavily in AI research. Um, recently, uh, a few months ago, actually, they, they founded a new lab in Silicon Valley doing artificial intelligence research, sort of large, um, large scale, long term kinds of, of experiments to advance the state of the art in artificial intelligence. Um, Andrew Ng, uh, as, as Jika mentioned, it, um, the Stanford professor is now chief scientist at Baidu. And um, Adam Coates, who is one of Andrew Ng's uh, graduates, uh, is heading up this AI lab. So that's that's where I'm uh, where I fit in is that I'm now one of the members of this lab. Um, and I just wanted to uh, get out the message to all of you that we're hiring. So if any of you uh, are interested in talking to me about opportunities at Baidu, please uh, introduce yourselves and uh, email resumes. We, we would love to talk to you. We're looking for uh, both accomplished AI researchers as well as people with strong systems backgrounds. So people that know how to use GPUs well um, and uh, specifically clusters uh, of GPUs, lots of GPUs uh, working on one problem together. So contact me and, and uh, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, so um, machine learning. Machine learning runs everything these days. I mean, machine learning is a set of algorithms that really powers the internet. So um, Facebook, Twitter, Google, uh, all of the companies that you use every day, all of their products, they're all built around machine learning algorithms that are giving you recommendations, that are performing searches for you, understanding the queries that you make, figuring out uh, what the images uh, that you're looking at mean. Uh, they do speech recognition, machine translation, uh, soon autonomous driving I think is really going to change the way that a lot of us live. All of these things are built on machine learning. So, so you guys are already familiar with a lot of these machine learning uh, products because you use them every day. Um, and deep learning is really just uh, like um, the previous speakers were talking about. Deep learning is really just uh, a, a set of techniques in machine learning. They happen to be really useful ones. Um, here is a quote from Jeff Hinton in the New York Times uh, a couple years ago. He said, um, the, the point about this approach, deep learning, is that it scales beautifully. Ba basically, you just need to keep making it bigger and faster, and it will get better. There's no looking back now. OK, so here we are at the GPU HPC meetup group. This is like what we've been waiting to hear our whole lives, right? Like This is like, <laughs> finally, the skills that we know about GPUs, about HPC, are, are uh, connected to the great value machine that is the internet, right? So um, all of the internet companies care deeply about improving their machine learning results because that's what powers their 
sales. You know, that's that's what makes it makes a sale for Google is that the ad was placed correctly and it was interesting, so somebody clicked on it. Right. So small improvements in the accuracy of these machine learning algorithms yield large uh, revenue increases for these companies. And so um, uh, it's really exciting now that there's a collection of algorithms that depend on the skills that uh, this audience has, right? So GPUs, um, clusters, that sort of thing. Uh, we're now being able to build much more accurate systems uh, because we have better computational resources. Um, I stole a slide from Jerry Chen, who is here, um, about uh, GPUs making a lot of things possible. This one is on ImageNet, which is a, an image um, uh, recognition, uh, basically competition, right? So here are some results over the past four years, and uh, we have two things plotted against each other. One is the, pers the um, error percent, so as that goes down, we're getting better and better. And then um, on this, these green bars are showing the percentage of teams that are using GPUs. So you can see that um, here in 2012, um, there there was a huge step function in this error. I mean, like look at the look at the change from here to here. You know, it was a few percent, and then from here to here, it like went down by a factor of two, right? So this is like a really really dramatic and surprising improvement, and it came to pass because some teams started using GPUs. So this is the reason why. And there's been a lot of interest in that, and you know, see the next year, basically everybody was using GPUs because it was just so obvious that you needed to do it this way. Um, I want to actually run a demo here from Clarify. Have you guys heard of this company, Clarify, before? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I thought we'd have some fun, uh, and let's see. Oh man, multiple monitors is a terrible thing. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's see if it works. So. Um, I baked some bread this week. I love to bake bread. Uh, and I take pictures and put them on Facebook all the time. So here's my bread. Uh, and let's see. All right. So um, Clarify thinks that this is artisan bread, food, sourdough, rustic, oven. So all of these tags that it predicted for this image are actually pretty amazing, right? And this is, this is just a picture that I uploaded to Facebook. Um, let me try another one. Uh, it does look artisan. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm very by that. I work hard to make my bread look artsy. You know, it's one of my passions. Um, so I got to go visit China um, a couple weeks ago, and so here's me at the Great Wall, and uh, look at the tags: China, man, wall, rock, fashion. I think I am pretty fashionable. And great. Great. Student. Student. Okay, I have a backpack on, right? It picked up that I'm wearing a backpack, which is pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do one more just for fun. So this is um, my new project. Uh, I had a little baby. Um, let's see what he picks up. Man, worker, kitchen, food, kid. All right, it finally got the baby down here. All right, so you know this is this is how machine learning algorithms work. You know, there, nothing is ever going to be perfect. Uh, there's always going to be room for improvement. But but I actually think that yeah, uh, you know, the ability to write programs that do this sort of thing is pretty amazing, right? Like it feels like you know the future has arrived, right? And it's because um, these deep learning algorithms are remarkably successful, especially when you give them lots of compute resources. Okay, so hopefully that was that was kind of fun. Um, Deep learning is becoming ubiquitous. So all those other things that I told you about that power the internet and power all these companies, um, people are applying deep learning to them and getting good results. Um, most of them, you know, they're, they're not going to talk about these results publicly because they are really important to the company's bottom line. But um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people talking about deep learning in the valley because um, it's sort of well known that, that this technology is being widely applied and, and yielding some great results. Okay, so I want to talk, and I, I have until 8.30, right? Okay. Uh, I, I want to talk um, briefly about why deep learning has been so useful. Um, and it, it turns out that, uh, so machine learning uh, algorithms are all based on, you know, understanding data. And the way that, that we do that is by taking our, our input data, say an image, 
and we have to transform it into a feature representation, which is sort of a summary of the image. And we need that summary to be somehow useful in that it really differentiates between different kinds of things. So then we can feed that feature vector into a classification algorithm that's then going to learn a boundary that separates your data. Um, and a lot of machine learning traditionally has been done through custom feature extractors. So there's basically like different sets of feature extractors for every kind of problem that people have tried to apply machine learning to. You know, different sets of extractors for, for uh, image recognition, different feature extractors for speech, different feature extractors for text. Um, and that problem of applied um, engineering here, how, how do I come up with a feature representation for my problem, is a really important one. And it usually, in the past, it's taken like somebody getting a PhD thesis on, this is the set of features that I'm going to use for this particular speech recognition task. right? Um, so here's a list of computer vision features, SIP, TOG, Textons, you know, they, they go on and on. Audio features, we have spectrograms, we have null frequency capstrom coefficients, we have zero crossing rates, and, and so forth. Um, text features, we can make parse trees, we can you know, figure out ontologies. Um, basically, we, every time we do this, um, it requires a lot of work, and it requires a lot of domain-specific knowledge, and this problem of how do I come up with a feature representation for the, the problem that I'm trying to solve is basically what um, machine learning has been for a long time. So it's basically been about feature engineering. Um, so hopefully I've set up, you, you guys should be feeling like, OK, maybe there's something different, right? And that's, that's actually what deep learning is. So deep learning is a way of automatically deriving features so that we don't have to manually do it every time. That's the reason why it's so exciting and it can be applied to so many different domains is because this really important step uh, that requires lots of expert PhD time and uh, is very you know, risky, we, we can just learn it. We can have a computer learn it for the problem that, that's at hand. OK, I'm going to skip a bunch of slides because um, we're running out of time. But um, let's see. Basically, I'm just showing, showing some examples of how this could work. Um, but, but here's, here's um, sort of the high level point, is that you can take your input data, and you can learn some uh, low level feature, like let's say edges. Let's say we, we, could, we, could train, we, could, uh, we could train a neural network to recognize edges and images. And, and those are useful features. We know they're useful because um, in the brain, we see that that happens. The very first thing that your visual cortex does is find edges. Um, uh, and it turns out they, they can be useful in, in classification tasks as well. Uh, now, if we stack layers on top of that, uh, each of the layers is sort of learning combinations of features, right? So um, uh, maybe. Uh, let's see, we, we continue to stack. Uh, here's, here's a good example. If we start out with pixels and we're, we're trying to learn face, face images, the first layer might do edge detectors, the second layer might do um, parts of faces like noses and eyes, and the third layer might look for object models. Um, so, so that's basically the idea of deep learning is in, in a nutshell, is that we're going to um, build up feature representations, and the deeper our networks are, the more abstract those features are going to be. And uh, then we're going to be able to, to make decisions. Um, I'm going to skip this as well, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, OK. So um, let's talk about um, a paper from 2012. So this is a, this is a paper that the ERSATS people mentioned. I, I forgot your name. What, what was your yeah. name? David, that David mentioned. Um, so uh, this, this work was done uh, by Andrew Ng and a group of people at Google. And they said, you know, what, what features could we learn in an unsupervised way if we just made a computer watch uh, YouTube videos? And we're going to have the computer reproduce the YouTube videos as faithfully as possible with as sparse a representation, uh, sparse of features as possible. The idea being that sparse features are useful features, right? If I have a vector and one of the components is really active and the others are all flat, that kind of, it's almost a classification in and of itself that it says that particular element of the feature space is it, it, something that my 
data belongs to really strongly. So um, if I if I train the system just saying I want to reproduce the data as as uh, faithfully as possible, but I want the features to be as sparse as possible and therefore as discriminative as possible, what could I do? And if I stack them on top of each other, could I learn um, high-level semantic features that make sense to people? And so that's what they did. Uh, they trained on 10 million images from YouTube videos, and uh, it was running on a, a machine at Google that had a thousand nodes. Each of those nodes had 16 cores, so it was running uh, 16,000 cores for a week. And then we can um, test on new images to see what happens. Okay, skipping this. And it, it turns out that um, actually they were able to find some neurons that were selective for higher level features. So this one uh, is a the, the face neuron they found that one of the outputs of the system uh, was was selective for faces, which kind of makes sense because um, in YouTube videos there's a lot of faces. So th the reason why this work is so cool is not because they made a face detector. I mean, people have been making face detectors forever. The reason why this work is cool is because they didn't tell it anything about faces, right? They learned that the face feature was important just by exposing it to large amounts of data, right? And so that's the exciting thing is that Man, if, if we can teach a computer how to recognize the important patterns without having a human say, okay, we're going to make a face recognizer, faces are built out of eyes and noses and, and so forth, then uh, we have a general purpose technique that can be applied really to any domain, right? And that's, that's the exciting thing. Not, not that there's actually a face detector, because the face detector is not actually that great of a face detector, but the fact that the computer learned it as a high level feature, that's, that's exciting. Um, okay, so. Then they went in to say, now that we've got these higher le high level features, can we train a classifier that's going to um, perform well on a difficult classification task? In this case, it was the ImageNet 22,000 class uh, benchmark, where you have uh, 22,000 different kinds of, of objects that you're trying to recognize, and they're pretty fine grained. So um, if I highlight it here, um, there's like a difference between a rough tail stingray and an Atlanta, Atlantic manta ray. Um, and so here's some representative images of those different classes. Um, most people actually wouldn't be able to tell the difference between stingrays and manta rays, right? Um, this data set's also really great at differentiating between breeds of dogs. So like it can tell the difference between like an Alaskan Malamute and a Husky, uh, even though, again, that's kind of specialized knowledge. Um, so this is a really hard task. and um, if you just took a random guess with 20,000 different um, choices, then you're going to get like 0.005% accuracy on average, right? Let's just random guess. The state of the art at that point was 9.5%, which is you know multiple orders of magnitude better than random, but still uh, pretty bad. Um, so then when they added these higher level features, they got up to 18%. Um, and so that was pretty exciting. And since then, um, some convolutional neural networks using supervised techniques have improved significantly on this result. Um, so that was that was kind of the um, the the lay of the land um, <coughs> when I joined this project. So um, basically, we're like, okay, we think we have something really cool here. We're able to f use deep learning to find really high-level features that have semantic meaning. Um, but one of the big problems is that in order to run that experiment, it took a supercomputer that only very few institutions are going to have access to. You know, a thousand nodes with 16 cores each, that's that's expensive just to maintain. Um, so we need to scale, right? So um, this, this particular network that we were just talking about had up to 1.7 billion parameters in it. Um, but what, what we want to do is democratize that so that um, people are able to uh, use those kinds of networks not just in a big at a big institution but just every lab or every researcher should be able to run these kinds of experiments by themselves um, okay so skipping this as well um, <coughs> all right so we're, we're going to parallelize over a bunch of GPUs and how are we going to do that um, so there's a couple different ways to scale the computation of neural networks um, whether we're talking about GPUs or not, uh, it sort of doesn't matter. Um, the simple solution is often called data parallelism. And the idea there is that, OK, we've got 10 million images. 
So we can break them up into shards and give each node a shard of that 10 million image data set. And then we can train the networks uh, sort of independently. And then every once in a while, uh, so basically we're going to give each node its own copy of the model. And then every once in a while, we're going to synchronize them and sort of combine the models that are being independently built on the different subsets of the training set. Um, so that's what the uh, that's that's what a lot of people use. Um, what we ended up doing, oh, okay. I guess I should say uh, the sort of disadvantage of this model. The disadvantage is that you now have multiple copies of the model, so you need to figure out how they should be kept in sync with each other and what what does like. What is the model when you have like a whole bunch of different, like a thousand models, each of which have seen a small part of the data? Like, can you just average them together? You know, does that actually work? Probably not. Um, so, so how are you going to synchronize as you train these machines so that um, the model that you built, you know, with the entire data set, is, is useful? Um, and secondly, it's really difficult to fit big models on GPUs. So, GPU memory. Um, is order you know 12 gigabytes per <coughs> GPU, but if you have a model with um, you know two billion parameters, then that's like eight gigabytes of model right there. So then you're not left with very much memory to hold the um, training set, or even a fraction of the training set. Yeah. Wouldn't you come up with the different models if you actually train it in parallel and then the synchronization process? Absolutely. Yeah, of course you're going to come up with different models. Mm -hmm. The thing is that there's no one optimal model. So this is a non-convex optimization problem. And um, there's basically an infinite number of models that have exactly the same uh, performance. And then there's like an even bigger infinity of models that have close to the same performance. So. Um, yeah, so you're not going to come up with the same model. Like all these parallelizations are going to give you slightly different models, but the, um, you know, as long as they perform well, then it doesn't really matter. Um, it is a reference you put as alter models, just list of names. Uh, yeah, this the, these slides come from our ICML talk. So here's me. Um, the, these are all Stanford people, um, and Andrew Ng, the professor now. Adam Coates, the first author on this paper, is now running the Silicon Valley AI lab at Baidu. He's my new boss. Um, so I'm working with him again. Basically, we're doing stuff that's a lot similar to this, um, but at a different scale, right? Because we're, we're now at a company instead of a university. Yeah? Isn't there any asynchronous, asynchronous ways? Yes, absolutely. There's lots of asynchronous ways to do that, and um, that's what people usually try. Yeah. <coughs> Um, the problem is that the more asynchronous you get, the worse your results are because you, you get um, more and more divergent. And so this question of how do you bring them back to like some ground truth agreement on what the model is, is harder. And like I said, it would be nice if we could just average them. But it turns out that just averaging models together, um, like averaging the weights of the models, is not very good. Because basically, what, if you think about it in a multidimensional space, the averaging sort of brings you into the middle. But like, if you have lots of different points, the, the middle is probably not where you want to be. What you want is some place that's along the manifold of good um, models, right? And that's, that's not usually going to be linear. So like, averaging is a, is a simple thing to do, but like, it, there's no justification for why it would work. Um, OK, so what we did instead of um, data parallelism is model parallelism, where we take the model itself. We're going to assume a really large model with lots of parameters. And we're going to shard that model over a lot of different GPUs. Um, so the advantage of that is that it scales to much larger models. Um, the disadvantage is that now we have even more frequent synchronization. Because before, like we maybe synchronize every little batch of data that we process. Now we need to synchronize at every layer of these deep networks. Because we're going to compute activations. And some of those <coughs> activations are going to be necessary. Um, on another node in order for it to compute the activation of a subsequent layer. This is a very standard HPC sort of um, uh, pattern. It's very similar to running stencil codes, right? If you partition a stencil code, you end up with halo cells, ghost cells. The exact same problem here. Why yeah. do you say that you rely just on local connectivity? Oh, uh, so the, the local connectivity is basically, uh, we're saying that because our network that we're structuring here um, has this property that it's um, basically locally connected, then if we shard the model, we can bound the connectivity to the other nodes, and that bound is really small because it's locally connected. If we had a network that was, say, 
a power law structure where like every node in the network was connected to every other node of the network, then if you tried to partition that network, it would be really hard to bound the cut. Um, but know. do you sort the data before so you you have locality? Uh, the locality is actually a choice of, of the network that we, we decided to use. So in this case, we're, we're uh, building this network for images. And so we're going to assume that um, neurons talk to each other within a small radius. So that gives us a local connectivity pattern. Um, and and it, you know, in, in two dimensions, right? So every pixel talks to every pixel within you know, some radius, right? So, so that gives us our, our sparsity structure of how the network is built. And that structure is really easy to partition. So that's what we say here. You're going to have to update weights across all the nodes? We do have to update weights across all the nodes, but it's easier to do that because we can statically understand what that update entails. If, if the, if the uh, connectivity of the neural network was a lot more irregular, then it would be harder to do this partitioning. Yeah? Is there um, any equivalent in machine learning to the notion of kernel efficiency, like I learned the training set as well as I could in the time, <coughs> and that you know trying to do better is not possible or realistic? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I am not a theoretician. So there, there are a lot of machine learning theoretician people who would probably answer that question yes, because there are lots of theoretical results in machine learning. The problem is that um, applying them in practice is somewhat difficult. Um, so like, for example, there's, there's a very famous result in neural networks that says any nonlinear function, no matter how complex, can be approximated with a three-layer neural network. You don't need more than three layers. However, all of the progress that we've been having recently has been with networks of more than three layers. So like, there, there's a theoretical result, which is true. It's just not very helpful, because uh, the practicalities of, of how we know how to train networks today um, tend to bring us in another direction. Um, so like, a, a question of like, you know, have, have we figured out whether we've sort of wrung all the data out of our training set? Um, I think people mostly understand that from a, a sort of empirical point of view. You know, they sort of notice they're getting diminishing returns when they try new stuff, and they decide, I need a bigger data set. But there's definitely a lot of black magic there. When, when yeah. you're going to more abstract uh, knowledge, don't you have to have a more global kind of communications? Um, typically, yes. Um, so typically, the way these networks are structured is that um, as you go up the network, you're usually doing some sort of downsampling, um, which tends to bring in information from farther away. Um, so by the end, you know, so basically with an image, you start out with some pixel field, um, which is really shallow. You have like three colors, right? RGB or, or whatever color space you're in. Um, but it's you know it's a big big field. By the end, you've shrunk it down to like one pixel, which is going to be your um, your category vector, and it's deep, like maybe a thousand categories, right? So so the network is sort of like iteratively squashing the image, like making it smaller, but also making it deeper because the the features at each at each layer of the network we're extracting more features, uh, and we're applying them more globally to the image as a whole. So sort of iteratively squash it, and by the end we. We end up with this really skinny, uh, deep vector that gives us our classification. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the actual implementation, did you use sparse matrix techniques, and if so, were they problematic to implement in computing? Um, okay, so uh, we. It turns out that for this problem, uh, the main computation is a sparse matrix vector multiply. However, it's a very particular sparse matrix vector multiply that um, actually can be mapped. Uh, very densely onto a GPU. So we wrote our own custom kernels to do that, um, and uh, they performed really well. Um, in general, like uh, the fully general sparse matrix problem is also really great on GPUs because it's bandwidth bound, right? So um, if you if you look at any sparse matrix optimization, the fundamental thing that you're you're optimizing is you have to load in the entire set of sparse uh, entries in your matrix. Right, and and um, that's going to be a bandwidth bound problem, and GPUs have a lot of bandwidth. So GPUs are actually really great at sparse matrix computations in general. This one was technically a sparse matrix, but implementing it felt more like a dense matrix. Yeah. Could you? Is 
there a short way to explain uh, those images like the space <coughs> neuron image or the camera? Oh, right. Like the, the gray in the image means that that is a part of the image that's not activated by? So, right. So basically, the way that we get those images is by after we're done training, and we we found mm -hmm. um, just by trial and error, like we, we, we say we have a test set that we know contains faces. And we look at, at all of our neurons and see which of the neurons is best at classifying the images as faces or not faces. So we found one that was the best, and it sort of separated faces and non-faces. Then what we do is we run another program to do a numerical optimization to try to force the output of that neuron as high as we can get it. And so then that's the thing that we display as sort of the heat map of the, the inputs that are going to excite that neuron the strongest. Um, so it's sort of still color differences, looking like a face or like gradient differences. How do you the cheeks of the face or the eye? <coughs> right. Yeah. Um, so in in this case, it's because the input was a color image. So when we optimize it, we're going to get a color. Now it was mostly gray because it turns out that that particular neuron is not very selective for color because people's faces can be different kinds of color. It did sort of notice that the lips are usually a little bit more red. But, um, you know, like the cat one, it looks like this ghost cat, right? It's, it's hard to see um, any particular cat in there. It's a little scary. And, th and there's no color, like it's, it's mostly all gray. And that's because it sort of averaged out all the different colors. Yeah? In addition, did you feel that are you also looking into FPGAs or custom insects, and do you have any results on um, So yeah, so uh, there are people that are doing that. Um, there's a lot of companies that are doing that. In fact, um, I just recently saw that Baidu has a talk at Hot Chips this year talking about uh, doing this, these kind of networks on FPGAs. <coughs> Um, personally, so uh, just a little bit of background, um, my master's degree was all about um, applications on FPGAs, and I was really excited about doing applications on FPGAs, and then like I spent a year or two doing it, and I got so frustrated with like building programs on FPGAs that I quit, and I went to GPUs. And um, so, so I'm very biased when it comes to this question, because like I've had a certain amount of pain that like turn me off of FPGAs, but, but I actually think that my experience is somewhat instructive because the reason that FPGAs are hard to use is, is not actually going away. Like FPGAs are always going to be a lot harder to program than GPUs, and because the design cycle for an FPGA is a lot longer, it's not really a software design, it's more of a hardware design cycle, then um, it, it's, it's harder to uh, update your algorithm. You know, the, this field is still very... Um, young and sort of unsettled, and we're changing the algorithm all the time. So uh, I personally feel like it's a little bit early to be baking things into hardware. That's my, my feeling. But other people disagree with me, and maybe uh, they'll come talk to this group later. Scott. So how much, since you've played with FPGAs, how much of attainable performance do you think they'll sap away with that new OpenCL abstraction layer on this? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so. You know, my, my, um, my feeling about that is that you can sap away infinite amounts of performance mm -hmm. with abstraction. And one, one great example, I love Python. Have any of you guys ever benchmarked a loop in Python? <laughs> it's like 10,000 times slower than a loop in C, right? And Python's actually faster than some of the other interpreted languages out there. So, so I, can, I can make an arbitrary, like I can make a virtual machine that in between every assembly language instruction um, emails a 10 gigabyte file to China, you know, and I can make it arbitrarily long. I can sap away arbitrary amounts of performance. There's no bound other than my lifespan of how much performance I can, <laughs> I can sap away with a bad programming model. So, like, to this question of, like, how bad is OpenCL on FPGAs, I, I believe, actually, that you can write OpenCL code that will run well on FPGAs, but that OpenCL code is going to feel more like Verilog mm -hmm. than like GPU <laughs> programming. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm not actually sure like whether it provides a lot of bang mm -hmm. for the buck. That's just my gut feeling, and and uh, I'm, you you should have Altera come in and tell you why I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, hope, I hope this is a meaningful question. Uh, you had uh, automated automated training exercise that found a face neuron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In in that automated training, did it say, oh look at this, there's a third dimension to this two dimensional? Oh, because of video? 
Well, the fact that people turn their faces. Oh, right. Um, yeah, so if you read the paper, actually, uh, they show results for um, different kinds of translations and rotations and in plane, out of plane. Um, basically, to show that this neuron is uh, selective for faces, even invariant under some of those. Now, there's this this particular neuron had limits. Like you can you can see the graph of like performance as a function of the angle <coughs> that the face presents, and it, it definitely falls off when the face is really oblique. Um, but but it does have a certain amount of invariance. To that so it wasn't smart enough to say, oh, there's a third dimension, and this is a two dimensional projection. No, thank you. No, it it wasn't. Uh, it did learn a little bit of invariance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, once you train all the system of neurons, uh, is it possible to reduce it perhaps by removing the neurons that yes. are the least significant? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's very possible. Um, well, so it turns out that it's a lot easier to take a model, a large model that you trained sort of in a fully connected way, and boil it down and bake it into a sparse small model that you can then deploy, say, on a cell phone than it is to train a small model to begin with. Um, and so uh, basically, I mean, a lot of the weights in these models are zero. So you can just like turn into a sparse problem and just throw those away. I mean, that's actually one of the uh, optimization criteria is that we want the weights to be as small as possible. Or actually the activations, but having the activations be as small as possible makes a lot of the weights zero as well. Um, uh, so yeah, you can definitely do that. And, and you can also just, Play around with like hacking pieces off of it and seeing what happens. Okay. So that's what people like do. randomly removing a particular neuron after the after training the system. Or yeah, like just like removing a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so people do that. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to skip over this. Okay. Um, so we were talking about two different <coughs> ways of of parallelizing a, a, a neural network while we're training. So with data parallelism. We can synchronize, um, we're, we're going to have lots of different models and we're going to have to sort of bring them in sync. Mm -hmm. um, so on a typical Ethernet cluster, to move a billion parameters around takes about 30 seconds. So it's pretty expensive, but we don't have to do it all the time, right? We only have to do it, I don't know, however often we want to keep our models in sync. Um, with model parallelism, uh, we are moving around much smaller amounts of data. So we're moving around sort of like halo cells. Um, and it's a lot faster. But the thing is that we have to do this for every layer. And we have a deep layer, a deep network with lots of layers. So that, that becomes, the network bottleneck becomes really important. So this is why um, we moved to InfiniBand. Um, so we built this network out of um, InfiniBand using FDR switches. Um, and that gave us 56 gigabits um, between nodes and microsecond latency. And then we built um, each of our nodes with four GPUs in them. Well, we were using GTX 680s that were running at somewhere around a teraflop. Um, one of the things that was really helpful when we were writing this code was um, there's some libraries for MPI that are GPU aware. So CUDA has this feature um, called Unified Virtual Addressing that allows um, libraries like an MPI library to know whether a pointer is living in a particular GPU or on a CPU without having to like augment the data structures to keep track of where a pointer lives. And because of that, um, you can write MPI stacks that are fully GPU aware. You just do MPI sends and receives on pointers. And the library decides, oh, this is a send and receive between two GPUs that are sitting on the same root complex of PCIe. So I can initiate a DMA transfer using the GPU's hardware DMA engine versus this is a pointer on one node, this is a pointer on another node, so I'm going to have to use InfiniBand to move it around. And, you know, maybe my GPUs are set up with GPU Direct, so it can use RDMA, maybe they're not. All these sorts of details are abstracted away. Right? We don't have to deal with them. We just use MPI and get whatever the best performance uh, that we can get. Uh, so that worked out pretty well for us. Um, and then because we, we use uh, MPI to deal with all of our communication between GPUs as well as between nodes, then um, the kernels that we write to run on the GPUs are just normal kernels. So there's, there's no magic there. Um, basically, what we do is we, we start an MPI process for every GPU. Um, and then when we need to, for example, interchange data, like so we've, we've cut the model. And this, this side of the network needs one activation from that side. And that side needs one activation from this side. Um, 
then we can just sort of ask for it. Um, we did that with a distributed array class that we wrote. So imagine that we have our model and it's partitioned amongst a bunch of different GPUs. Um, for example, to compute the activation for this neuron highlighted in blue, we may need a bunch of data from a bunch of other GPUs. But what we can do is aggregate that because we have local connectivity with um, the other neurons that are sitting in our GPU. And we can come up with um, sort of a, a static understanding of the union of all of the data that we're going to need to move in order to compute the next activation. And uh, I highlighted that in red here. Um, and then so what we can then do is um, break that down into some separate transactions. So instead of having like a billion tiny transactions, now we just have three sort of bulk transactions. And um, that makes sure that we're using our interconnect efficiently. And that's possible because our network had this connectivity structure. OK, um, so this is actually um, answering the, the question that somebody asked about sparse matrix. So it turns out that the, the weights for our, our matrix end up with this block sparse structure. And um, we can map that into things that feel really dense. So it basically was like a matrix multiply with a couple of extra for loops wrapped around it. Um, and and uh, that actually went pretty well. OK, so we had. Good scaling. Um, I'm going to skip this. I think this slide is, is more interesting. Um, so here, what, what I'm showing is a bunch of different sizes of model running on a bunch of different GPUs and then showing the, the speed up. So the dashed line would be perfect linear speed up. And it's not a straight line because um, the axes aren't really aligned. Like This is like an exponential thing. And this is a, a square thing because it turned out in our code it was easier to run. Um, things if, if the number of nodes was, was a, a perfect square. Um, so you can see that um, if we took a small model and tried to parallelize it over a lot of GPUs, that it sort of peters out. And this is the classic HPC strong scaling problem, right? Where if you take take a small problem and try to make it go faster, after a certain point, it just you're just not really getting anything from it. Um, but we can do weak scaling where we can go to bigger models. Uh, and so as we go up here, uh, this, this model was so big that it only fit on all 64 of our GPUs at once. So we couldn't even fit the model on a smaller instantiation of the, of the problem. Um, and you know, we're getting reasonable performance. So this one was like um, you know, 47 times more throughput than this one uh, running on 64 GPUs. So we, we were pretty happy about that. Um, and we were able to duplicate the results of the earlier Google paper uh, that we started talking about using uh, three nodes instead of 1,000. And then we were able to go on to train bigger networks than they were able to. Oh, sorry. What was the um, elapsed time for this big and bigger problems? Um, so these, grow, like power of two, power of three? So the elapsed time to train one of these is order of days. Um, like the, our biggest one, it, it took um, several days, maybe a week for the biggest one. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, I was asking, when you increase linearly the, the parameter size, for example, the last time with running n, n squared or n cubed? Oh, uh, it, it should be, in this particular case, it should be linear. So the, the runtime should be a linear increase in the parameters. It's just that you know we have to distribute it across lots of GPUs, so we're not going to get a perfect linear speed up. Okay. Yeah. So this was yeah. uh, four GPUs per node, three yeah. nodes. Right. So with uh, 64, and that that's 16. Oh, 64. Nodes. Yeah. yeah. And the reason there are 16 nodes is because the cheapest InfiniBand switch has 16 ports. Uh, so yeah. if you want to go more than 16 nodes, then you have to buy a much more expensive <coughs> switch. OK, uh, so that's actually the end uh, of my talk. Um, machine learning runs the internet. Deep learning is making it better. Um, and it's really compute intensive, which is why GPUs are useful. And um, lots of people are hiring, including us. So come talk to me if you're interested. Yeah, thanks. Any uh, last minute question? We'll just take one. Yeah. I was just wondering if you had seen the paper about the adversarial examples that they yes. had done on, on yes. like these deep networks. And yes. Thought about what that means and what's going on. Okay, so let me give some context. So this paper uh, is a really great paper by um, NYU folks that um, are really uh, NYU is one of the um, 
uh, leaders in, in this particular kind of deep learning. So there's a lot of really smart people there. And they um, basically took a network that was trained to recognize images, and then they tried to do the opposite of what we were talking about earlier. So what I was talking about earlier was let's find the input that maximizes the output. They said, let's run an optimization problem to find the input that's as close as possible to an input that, that should be recognized correctly, but instead gets recognized completely wrong. And we'll do that uh, as much as possible. So they found a lot of adversarial examples that look completely indistinguishable from test cases that are correctly classified that get wildly wrong answers. And um, so then, so this is like this existential question about like what are deep neural networks actually doing, right? Because if you can confuse a neural network with an input that to a human looks the same a as another input, then maybe it's not reliable. Like maybe the, the deep neural network uh, is brittle in some sense. And, and, and there's a certain truth to that. Um, however, I think uh, the, the way that I understand it is that um, you know, we're learning these really complicated nonlinear manifolds. And because of the dimensionality of the problem, there are a very large number of points that are very close, like in Euclidean space, to points that we care about, but that are actually really um, low probability. Um, and these are sort of the blind spots of these models, because when we train them, you know, they're, they're not in the training set. Um, actually, this paper suggested adding these adversaries to the training set to try to make your model a little bit smarter and a little bit more resistant to these um, these problems. Um, I think that it's an area of active research to see exactly how well that works. I don't think there's uh, a consensus on that yet. Um, but I mean, to me, it really doesn't matter like uh, whether there's a blind spot. I mean, as humans, we have many blind spots. Like there, are, there are many things that um, humans recognize incorrectly that that we can get computers to recognize correctly. Uh, you know, all sorts of optical illusions and, and uh, biases in the way that our brains work um, that get us into trouble all the time. So the fact that computers have, that these neural networks have, have similar blind spots doesn't really scare me very much. Um, I guess the question is, are they useful? And you know, I would say like the example that I showed you where I uploaded pictures that I took from Facebook and just uploaded it and it, it came up with it, answers that were correct. I think is you know it's, it's another example that you know these things are useful and the fact that these algorithms are being deployed widely in every part of the internet I think is, is uh, even more convincing evidence. So yes, these these problems exist, um, but I don't think it's a fatal flaw. Sorry, one last question. Yeah, I think there's another approach to that problem. This uh, technology that you're talking about is bottom up. It takes the data and tries to figure out what's there. It doesn't have a guide. It doesn't have expectations. I'm really looking for bad guys. I'm really looking. There are in the psychology world. There are lots of uh, results. I show pictures to different categories of people, and they see different things in them. I show a picture of a native village to you and me. We will notice the chicken running across the road. The villager who lives there knows about the chickens. He doesn't care. He notices that somebody's doing something wrong on the other side of the fireplace. So, if, I think this problem that was brought up just now might be largely addressed by having a suitable set of sensitivities, expectations. What is the thing looking for? What does it care about being able right. to distinguish? Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, you know, these algorithms I think are still in their infancy. And I expect techniques like that are going to be the next step in making them really useful. So, yeah, thanks. Great, was that. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> So there you have it, uh, meetup number 41. If you like the meetup, please give us a five-star review so we can continue these good, great meetups. And thank you, and see you next month.